a special needs student attacked nearly 100 times on a school bus. And a bus driver who says he didn't see anything. The bites, kicks, punches left a mark on a little girl who couldn't speak or defend herself against her attacker or the school district that put her in harm's way. What precautions did the school district take to ensure that JM would not be physically aggressive on the special needs bus to Ruby Elementary School? I don't know that I can know the answer to that question. A lawsuit uncovered evidence the school district was warned months before that something could happen. And when Karen forwarded this email to you on September 4th, 2018, what was your response? Might not be a uh, bad idea to at least do some cost analysis. The district knew something about its special needs buses all along, something it kept from the public. I didn't think it would be like this at all. I thought they, they would have more of a heart of a, like a teacher, like, you know, concern and, and loving. But as, as you know, that was far from the reception I got. It appears that they don't care. Is that hard to say? Yeah. A South Carolina lawmaker has a plan to make sure this never happens again. We should not have to create legislation to protect our children, but that's what we're doing. Common sense had four years to prevail, but failed. If they had the urgency, a fraction of the urgency, to fix the problems as they did to try to hide what the warnings had been, this never would have happened. Parents place an incredible trust in a school district when they put their child on a school bus. That trust was broken in Chesterfield County when a nonverbal autistic child was attacked 96 times on a bus ride in 2018. Her parents sued more than three years ago, and the school district fought back. Well, that lawsuit settled in September. The school district and the State Department of Education paid $2.2 million to keep a jury from deciding the price the district should pay for what happened to Autumn Angle. And we want to warn you, the video you're about to see is violent and graphic. Here's Chief Investigator Jody Barr with tonight's The Longest Ride special report. How you doing today? Morning, how are you? All right. When the Angle family put their four-year-old daughter on the school bus that morning, they had no idea the little girl they got back would never be the same. Y'all have a good day. Thank you now. Bye. Bye, baby. Love you. Autumn Engel was diagnosed with autism, and at the time of this bus ride... Can you say Jasmine? Jasmine. She could say only a few words. In 2018, her parents enrolled her into a special needs program at Ruby Elementary School, a program where she'd get special care to jumpstart her education. Because of her severity, she was assigned to Ruby, which is in town, kind of two towns over from us, and about a 45-minute ride to, to and from school. But we were told that it would be safer for her, you know, to, to travel with her her group of students straight from the bus to the classroom. That's why she was on the bus that day. She would see that bus and oh God, she would just smile. The bus video shows Autumn sitting quietly, but 23 minutes into the ride, a nine-year-old child identified as JM gets on. Within 20 seconds, JM begins attacking Autumn. Those attacks continued for the next 30 minutes. The driver, a substitute driver named Ronnie Sires, would later tell investigators he didn't know what was happening behind his back. <laughs> the hour-long video shows J.M. keeping an eye on the driver, then he'd strategically attack. The attacks went on, even as Autumn continued crying out. Sire stopped at a school and left his seat with the bus running to let a wheelchair-bound student off. There was no other adult on the bus. The recording shows at one point Sires tried to console Autumn. <laughs> Autumn couldn't tell the driver what happened. 
JM, though, could already see the damage his punches did to Autumn's lips. The video shows JM did not attack Autumn on the final 12 minutes of the ride to school, but Sires knew this wasn't normal for Autumn Angle. The bus recording shows JM getting on, and right behind him was Autumn. In the video, it's clear she did not want to get on the bus. When she got to the top of the steps and spotted JM, she turns to her teacher and begins to cry. Sire strapped Autumn back into her seat and began the 45 minute ride home with Autumn and another student under attack. The afternoon attack started as pinches, grabbing and punches to Autumn's face, then quickly escalated over the next 37 minutes. The recording shows JM biting Autumn and many more punches to her face. He even slammed Autumn's head into the back of her seat. At one point, the other nonverbal student stands up and appears to try to get the driver's attention. Still, despite that and Autumn's constant cries, the driver continued on as JM continued his attacks until seconds before Autumn's bus stop, where her dad rushes to the bus. <laughs> Really? Was, has, has she been like this the, the whole time? The whole time. This morning time she got on the bus. <laughs> really? Time. I have no idea what could be going on with it. Maybe she's just off. Maybe she's just off today. Well, Normally yeah. she doesn't she doesn't ever do this. I want to say this is the first time I experienced it. Yeah. yeah, she's probably just off. Maybe she doesn't feel good. It's hard to tell because she can't really talk. I know. Coming up. Within minutes, Autumn Engel's parents were on the phone with 911 and rushed her to the hospital. This was my worst nightmare. This was one of my worst nightmares happening right before my eyes. Law enforcement interviewed the bus driver and an attorney would soon uncover evidence the district was warned about its special needs buses months before the attacks. And you didn't follow up to find out when that dangerous situation got addressed? No, sir, not in the sense of going and asking daily or weekly. Had you informed the school district or the school board at all of those warnings at the time of that meeting? No, sir, I shared that with you earlier. I had not. That really is just the completely unreasonable and unacceptable thing here. They knew about it. They knew they weren't going to be doing anything about it anytime soon, and they refused to warn the parents about it. When our The Longest Ride special report continues after the break. One thing Jessica Condon promised her daughter. I feel like I could do this with my eyes closed. She'll never ride the school bus again. You said your daughter felt like she wanted to be a big girl. Oh, she, yeah, she did love the bus. She did think she was, like I said, she, her level of fear. She didn't have fear, and she did, she loved it. Is that what hurt you most about this, is that that was taken from her? In a way, yeah. And it hurts me more that my trust was taken because I have to take her to school every day. And I have to leave her in the same hands that allowed this to happen. Not so much the teachers, but in the same district that, that covers the schools. And I really, I really miss that excitement and that trust. I think it looks like her a little bit. The 
and that's always important. We try to teach her to live in our world, but we don't try to change her as a person. Autumn's not that little four-year-old girl now. She's eight, about the same age as JM was during that bus ride four years ago. This was my worst nightmare. I was terrified that something would happen to my daughter and we wouldn't be able to figure out how it happened because my daughter can't tell me. We could tell from the marks themselves, we could deduct what happened. But she, you know, even at four years old, she didn't have those words. Although she's had the bus video for four years now, Jessica Condon still hasn't watched it all. It reminds me of like prisoner of war just being tortured to get some information from them. But this is a do uh, my daughter on a school bus. Four years old. Four years old. And she can't speak? No. And she was, all she could do was scream. And she was screaming. I mean, blood curdling screams. That's why, I, that's why I can't watch it. All she really did was look out the window and scream. I think if she, she thought that if she turned her head and didn't see him, that maybe he would, he would disappear. One thing Condon says she worried about from the start, there were no adult attendants on her daughter's bus. I was worried about the behaviors, but I was also worried about, you know, what if they had candy? What if they choked? What if one had a seizure? You know, thinking like a nurse. What if this happened and the bus driver was driving? And would he see it? Would, you know, would they get the care they needed fast enough? Condon wanted the district to put an attendant on the bus. Her first stop, the district office. I left message after message after message. I never got to speak to an actual person. At the same time, Condon was working on the district. State your name for the record, please. My name is Erica Myers McBride. A Chesterfield County special needs bus driver was also pressing the district to put attendance on its special needs buses. Did you feel you could safely transport your students and do what was required of you to do as a bus driver without an attendant? No. And had you contacted your supervisor? I did. But that driver didn't stop there. She testified in this deposition. Her supervisor, Robin Barrett, never responded. Barrett is the district's special transportation coordinator. McBride says she then tracked down South Carolina Department of Education bus driver trainer PJ Krause, hoping that would get the district to listen. She stated that she's, she feels very frustrated that she did not feel as though her supervisor was taking her concerns seriously. And that's when I felt as though I could help by sending an email directly to her supervisors. Two months before the attacks, Krause warned the district of the safety issues of not having attendance on special needs buses. Krause learned the district didn't require attendance after Chesterfield County bus drivers confided in her during a training back then. Krause emailed the district's special education director, Karen Rogers, telling her that leaving bus drivers to deal with medical and behavioral disorders could potentially endanger the students, general driving public, and the driver. Rogers forwarded that email to her boss, Superintendent Dr. Harrison Goodwin, asking him if she should pursue this. Goodwin's response might not be a uh, bad idea to at least do some cost analysis. Goodwin read his email response during his deposition after Autumn's family sued Goodwin, the school district, bus driver Ronnie Sires, and the state education department. Goodwin also testified that although he met with his staff to discuss the state's warnings, the district still did not have a plan in place when Autumn Angle was attacked exactly two months later. Within those two months time frame, did you not at any point in time say, hey, what's going on with this? I don't know that I did. There was no cost analysis for placing attendance on special needs buses in the two months that passed between that first warning email from PJ Krause and the November 5th, 2018 attacks by JM against AA. That, that is correct. You knew by September 4th, 2018, that attendants should be supervising behavioral issues on special needs buses. Uh, that she had said that that was a role that they could help with, yes. Did you inform the school board of how the operation of your special needs buses potentially endangered the students, general driving public and driver? 
I did not. Goodwin also admitted the district never told these children's parents or the public of the state's warning. So you knew that this potentially dangerous operation of the special needs bus was out there and that y'all weren't going to address it immediately. Are the parents of the children on those buses not entitled to know of the potential danger to their children so they can make a decision of whether or not they're going to leave the child on the bus while y'all figure it out. If you, if you, you know, if you put it in those terms, it would have been a good thing to have let them know. In the two months between the state's first warning to the district and the attacks, the state's bus driver trainer and Rogers continued emailing with Rogers writing at one point, they'd look into the possibility of attendance. Then two days before the attacks, Krause found out the district still did not have attendance. She went to the district office that day, unannounced, to meet with Rogers. Would it be fair to say, Ms. Krause, that you were concerned that here it is some two months after you started the email dialogue with them and they still don't have attendance? Yes, sir. Then Monday morning, the very next school day, the morning bus ride happened. But the only thing the district knew at that time was Autumn was crying for some unknown reason. Just two hours after the morning bus ride on November 5th, Karen Rogers sent this email, letting Krause know the district was working toward a bus attendant plan in case something happened. Did something happen on November 5th, 2018? You referring to AA and JM? Yeah. Yes, sir. And so if you were sending this to PJ because you wanted her to have a copy in case something happened, why didn't you reach out to PJ to let her know that something had happened? I don't have an answer for that. I don't know. And so that email that came in when she said that on November 5th, 2018, um, before I told you today that that was the date of the attacks, did you realize that? I just made that connection. No, I, no, 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 sir. Okay. That, okay, that, that hurts a little. Three days later, deputies arrested Ronnie Sires. They charged him with unlawful conduct toward a child, a charge he was later indicted on, a charge that's still pending today. The state didn't know any of this until three months after the attacks, after Condon says the district still would not put attendance on the buses. She decided to give this video to reporters. The state saw the reporting and came calling. Nobody with Chesterfield ever told you about these attacks, did they? I learned about them in in February um, when I was told I was on the news. In April 2019, four months after these attacks, the state revoked Ronnie Sire's bus driving certificate. Had we not ever released it to the media, no, no report would have been filed with the state and he would still have his bus license and be riding the bus. So, I mean, it kind of feels a lot like a cover up to me. Were you shocked when you found out that the district never reported this to Columbia? Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't that seem automatic? You would think, but this was next level and no, nothing, nothing was reported, nothing at all. It was actually forgotten per them. They just forgot to file the report. You think they really forgot it? No, I don't think they forgot it at all. Coming up. Did the school board conduct any investigation or evaluation about the administrative actions that were taken <clears throat> leading up to the attacks and in the wake of the attacks? We do not do any, in, any investigating ourselves. Everything administratively falls on the superintendent. Internal records show the district knew JM was a threat long before they put him on that school bus. So even with the added steps, that the school district was taking to address JM's behavior. His behavior is getting worse. Obviously the prescription's not working. 
Now, a state lawmaker is promising to do everything he can to keep this from ever happening again. It makes me angry to know that we as a state failed with this child because it could have been prevented. When our The Longest Ride investigation continues after this. Two months before the settlement, uh, on superintendent's report. Dr. Harrison Goodwin left the Chesterfield County School District and took over the one right next door in Kershaw County. We asked Goodwin to schedule an interview with us, but he did not respond. His attorney, former state senator Vincent Shaheen, did to decline the interview. Because other families may have grounds to sue Goodwin, Shaheen advised the superintendent to not talk about what happened. Hey, Dr. Goodwin. Hey, how you doing? Hey, Jody Barman. I'm well aware. Appreciate you, uh, it. You uh, have a good evening. Is there anything that you want to tell the public about what no, they're sir. about to see? No, sir. We found Goodwin at this Kershaw County School Board meeting. We wanted to allow him the chance to have his say in this report. Why uh, didn't you and your administration not do something sooner when you got the warnings from the Department of Education? Bar? Yes, sir. We got to prepare for a meeting here. Goodwin was in charge of Chesterfield County Schools when the bus attacks happened and was still in charge afterward. The depositions turned up evidence that nearly two years after the attacks, the dangers the state warned about were still there. Were there any changes in the way the special needs buses were operated or in the way information was shared with bus drivers as a result of these attacks? No, sir, not that I'm aware of. Is it safe to characterize it as did nothing to address this? Well, it, it, it's certainly uh, safe to characterize it as they didn't address the problem. Jessica Condon hired Patrick McLaughlin to sue the district, the state education department, Dr. Goodwin, and the bus driver. McLaughlin uncovered two dangers in how school districts operate special needs buses in South Carolina. One, there is no law forcing school districts to put adult attendance on special needs buses with restrained children. And secondly, there is no law that forces districts to tell special needs bus drivers about children who could pose a health and safety risk on a school bus. Although the state education department admitted it has the power to do these things. But you guys are empowered to create regulations by which they have to operate the bus. Yes, sir. And there's nothing stopping the Department of Education from having a regulation that says for these particular situations, you got to have an attendant on the bus. I guess there would not be anything that would prevent the department from uh, establishing that regulation. I'm not the one that would be able to set that up. All right, raise your right hand, please. When J.M. walked onto Ronnie Sire's bus that morning, district records show he had 15 referrals on his record, 11 for physical aggression, and three of the 11 happened on a school bus, something Sires wishes he knew on November 5th, 2018. Do you think if you had known any of this information about J.M.'s history of physical aggression towards other students, you would have been better prepared to handle what happened on your bus on November 5th, 2018. I know I would have, sir. I would have been conscious of his action and his ways. JM's record shows one of the district's solutions to deal with his behavioral disorder was to put him on the special needs bus unrestrained and away from the general student population. They knew what his issues were. The only reason he was on that bus was because of those issues. I mean, all it would have taken was another set of eyes sitting there. And the truth be told, that little boy probably never does that because we know from his records that's when those attacks happen, when, when an adult's not paying attention to him. And it's clear that's what he was doing. I mean, you can see it in the video. He's waiting until the bus driver puts his eyes on the road, and then that's when he's doing it. At the time of the attacks, Chesterfield County Schools had 12 special needs bus routes. Only one of the 12 had an attendant because that child's education plan called for it. What precautions did the school district take to ensure that JM would not be physically aggressive on the special needs bus to Ruby Elementary School? I don't know that I can know the answer to that question. So even with the added steps 
that the school district was taking to address JM's behavior, his behavior is getting worse. Uh, the prescription certainly is not making it any better. Obviously, the prescription's not working. Well, I'm seeing, I'm seeing pain. I'm seeing suffering. I'm seeing a child hurt, and we failed this child, is what I'm seeing. Bite marks on a child that's defenseless. State Representative Richie Yao represents Chesterfield County. He didn't know until about a month ago the backstory uncovered in the lawsuit Autumn Engel's family filed against the school district. He took special exception to Dr. Harrison Goodwin's email response to the Education Department's warnings about those special needs buses. You think cost analysis was the wrong response? I think it's hogwash. How can you put a cost analysis on the life of a child? You can't. Yao introduced a bill that would do two things, force all South Carolina school districts to place adult attendance on special needs buses and require districts to share student health, safety and behavioral information with special needs bus drivers. We should not have to create legislation to protect our children, but that's what we're doing. Common sense had four years to prevail, but failed. Is Autumn's case exhibit A that the time to trust districts to do the right thing, the time to trust the State Department of Education to do the right thing, to do this without y'all telling them to do it, is that time over? It's time's over. That's when we've already drafted legislation where it's in draft to be pre-filed December 9th. Remember. We asked Dr. Goodwin's new district if it requires attendance on special needs buses and if that district shares student information with its special needs bus drivers. The district said that health information is shared on a need to know basis. School nurses share this information with bus supervisors and bus drivers and attendants are trained on emergency medications as needed. And Harrison Goodwin never agreed to sit down with us. Well, if you change your mind and there's anything you want to tell the people of Chesterfield County, Kershaw County, and the Angle family, please let me know. I think they would have to have a law governing them to enforce them, to make them do the right thing. I wish I could say, oh yeah, they'll 100% do the right thing. Safety is of the utmost importance, but going through what we went through, we, we know that, that sometimes money can be of the utmost importance. Love you. Now, four years later. You gonna put your backpack on? Jessica Condon's grown to appreciate these morning walks. There you go. Good girl. While trying to learn to trust her school district again. It wasn't until nine months after the attacks, the district added any attendance on its special needs buses. It took the district two years after the attacks to put an attendant on every special needs bus in the county. Although the district still does not have a written policy requiring adult attendance, we offered every person you saw in those depositions the opportunity to interview, but not one of them agreed to meet with us. When this case settled in September, the district issued a statement. We certainly regret deeply that this child suffered. We do not agree or accept the characterization of the case by the family's attorneys, the degree of fault on the district's part, or of its superintendent at the time, Dr. Harrison Goodwin, who served our district and community honorably and well during his tenure in Chesterfield County. Although the Chesterfield County School District and the State Department of Education paid $2.2 million to settle Autumn's lawsuit, the district's legal troubles might not be over. There was another child attacked on the bus that day, and even Superintendent Harrison Goodwin's attorney acknowledged the possibility of more lawsuits.